Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very, very happy and pleased to be here. I'm the Carol Tavris half of this duo. Um, and I became a fan of Linda Bartoshuk's some years ago when I was at a teaching of psychology conference in Florida. And I was going to the beach, I was playing hooky, and a friend came by and said, will you come with me to hear Linda Bartoshuk's uh, plenary session? And I said, no, no, I'm not really interested in taste after all, so I think I'll go to the beach. And my friend looked at me as if I had lost my mind and said, <laughs> It's Linda Bartoshuk. You go to hear Linda Bartoshuk if she's going to be reading the car repair manual. You just go and hear her. It doesn't matter what she's talking about. OK, I said, I'll go, I'll go. So I go to her talk, and I was enchanted from the first moment. First, of course, she told us what was wrong with the old tongue map that we had all learned in junior high school or high school, the four tastes on the tongue and blah, blah. And she told us we were wrong. And every intro teacher in the room and every textbook author in the room cringed in embarrassment that we had bought and promoted the tongue map unknowingly for so long. And then she went on to tell us about her fabulous research on the difference between super tasters and normal tasters, which has to do with the number of taste buds on the tongue and so forth. And everybody at their place had a little piece of paper infused with a chemical and a candy. And she said, now, we're going to do a little demonstration which will reveal to this audience of several hundred people which of you are super tasters and which of you are like me, whereupon she takes five or six of those little pieces of paper and chews them up and has no reaction to them at all. So we dutifully all do this. We put the little papers in our mouths. And pretty soon, we start hearing across the room the gentle hum of people yelling, ugh! and bleh, and oh, and a few Jews who said, oi. <laughs> For them, there was candy to mitigate the awful taste that they experienced as super tasters. Well, after that lecture, I was completely among the legions of people who are Linda Bartoshuk's groupies. And so, as I say, it truly is an honor as well as a pleasure for me to be here with Linda today. Thank you for agreeing to do this, Linda. <laughs> so now, Helen Keller once said many years ago that smell is the fallen angel of the senses. A lovely notion, I thought, and one she thought that was so understudied and undervalued and underappreciated, and certainly that is true for taste. So given that most small children don't say, when I grow up, I want to study taste, can you give us some background for your own interest in how you got to this field? You know, I can answer that um, a number of ways. First of all, I can tell you what I thought at the time I first heard somebody ask me that. It was totally accidental. I was an undergraduate at Carleton College. Um, when I graduated, uh, if you weren't engaged or planning to go to teacher's college, you went to graduate school. And so I was going to go to graduate school. And my teacher at Carleton had studied with Carl Foffman at Brown University. And so his name was John Baer. And he introduced me to the beautiful world of taste and thought that I should go study with his teacher. So I did that. And it wasn't for years that I finally put together a somewhat different picture of why taste was so interesting. Um, my father died of lung cancer when I was a junior in college. And one of the things that particularly bothered him was a metallic taste. The fact is, food didn't taste right. And it was such an appalling uh, blight on the quality of his life that I remember this very vividly. And at the time, of course, I knew nothing about it. And it is interesting that in retrospect, that's the problem that I got interested in. And fast forward a few years, and my brother died of liver cancer. He had taste symptoms as well, but by then, I knew a great deal about it, so I went to see him, evaluated him, but I couldn't fix it. What's interesting is that now, thanks to the work that a lot of my colleagues have done, and me too, we can treat it. And I suspect that all of that had a lot more to do with why I stayed in that field and loved it so much. That is so interesting. Tell us a little more about taste and pain in that context, that when you say, well, now we can treat it, how do we treat it? Yeah. What do you, what well, do actually, you it's interesting you mentioned pain, because it, it started out 
the, that we were interested in phantoms. And it turned out that uh, a colleague of mine, actually a graduate student in Canada, was working on something called burning mouth syndrome. How many of you know what burning mouth syndrome is? Okay. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Almost nobody, I want to talk to you all afterwards. Um, <laughs> She'll get data syndrome. from you, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> of those of you who have never run into it, it's a horrible pain disorder. It is said in textbooks to afflict postmenopausal women. So ladies, do I need to tell you what physicians think about postmenopausal women who come in and report pain and there's nothing wrong with their mouth? Well, it was considered psychogenic for years. But I had a friend who had it, and I wasn't psychogenic with her, so I got very interested. In any case, my friend in Canada, Miriam Grushka, was doing a PhD thesis on burning mouth syndrome, and half of the patients she saw had taste phantoms. They not only had burn in their mouth all the time, they had a taste there. And she knew what, what, that I was working on what, taste phantoms. What is a taste phantom? Oh, sorry. Taste phantom is a taste with no obvious stimulus. You wake up one morning and there's a salty taste in your mouth and it never goes away. Um, it's, it's a horrible disorder. It's akin almost to pain in terms of how much it annoys people. With, I can think of one patient who was an exception. She had a salty phantom and she began to eat butterscotch candy a lot because she thought it went so well with the phantom. <laughs> uh, she was an amazingly adaptive person. So anyway, Miriam, saw that she was getting these phantoms, she knew I was working on them, so I taught her how we evaluated phantoms. And we worked along and, and paid attention for a long time. And I'm trying to remember exactly how this happened, because at the same time, we were working on desensitizing oral pain with capsaicin. You all know capsaicin, chili pepper burn. You know that if you leave capsaicin on your tongue for at least 60 seconds, and then let the burn fade away normally, if you reapply it, it won't burn you have totally desensitized to it. And we had picked that up and we were using it as a technique to treat cancer patients with mucositis lesions. Well, one day, the Yale Health Plan sent me a law professor who had pain in his mouth that they couldn't help. And they said, try desensitizing him with capsaicin. So I did, and it didn't work. And I thought, well, that's interesting. At the same time, we were using anesthetic to diagnose taste phantoms, because the tricky thing is the phantom's in the brain. The phantom is caused because you've got a taste nerve that's damaged, and the nerves usually inhibit one another. You damage one, disinhibits a part of the brain, and you get a taste signal generated from that part of the brain. Okay, so we use anesthesia to diagnose taste phantoms, and don't ask me why. It's one of these things where when NIH asks you for hypothesis-driven science, they say curiosity's better. I thought to myself, what would happen if I put an anesthetic on this law professor's tongue? I did, his pain doubled. And I said, oh my God, burning mouth syndrome is a central pain phantom. And that is in fact what we now believe to be the case. Sorry, long answer. But that's fine with me. <laughs> Let me ask you then, in terms of your current work, um, one of the things in relation to the super tasters that you've described is that super tasters live in a, what you call a neon taste world of greater, greater intensity. And I'd like you to talk a little about that work with taste and its relation to weight, overeating, obesity, and the different taste worlds that you describe obese people living in. Um, super tasters and I should have mentioned, but I'm glad I didn't because now I have a chance to tell you what they are. Burning mouth patients are all super tasters. People who are not super tasters don't get burning mouth syndrome. After evaluating over 70 patients, I have never seen an exception. It looks as if if you have a huge density of taste buds on your tongue, you have a great deal more inhibition produced centrally. So inhibition is just much more active. Well, super tasters, we discovered, um, it, it took several steps. It's interesting. We were uh, revisiting an old taste blindness phenomenon that had been known since the 1920s. Um, a gentleman named uh, Fox discovered that there was a compound that some people couldn't taste at all and other people thought was very bitter. In fact, he discovered it because he dropped a bottle of it and it blew up in the air. And the guy standing next to him thought it was horrible and he didn't taste anything. And they had the wit to run around and test their colleagues and they found out that about 25% people could not taste it, the others could. 
Uh, they did a genetic family study within the year and found out it was a Mendelian recessive. Beautiful. And of course, it was studied everywhere. The Journal of Heredity put a little piece of filter paper where I got my idea in the journal, the issue they were first writing about this for people to test. And you could write in and buy them. People studied everything. The Dion quintuplets were tested, and they were all tasters. Um, so anyway, I have to tell you that I went to the Yale Library. I looked up this issue of the Journal of Heredity, and I committed one of the noblest acts of my life. The small piece of paper was still there, and I left it alone. I didn't <laughs> take it. I don't know, in retrospect, whether <laughs> maybe I should have taken it. Anyway, I did leave it there. So uh, suddenly, PTC testing was the rage, and people started to study it. But from the point of view, and you're a psychologist, so you'll love this, they measured thresholds, the lowest concentration you could just detect. But by the time I got interested in this, we were long past thresholds. We were into S.S. Stevens era. We were measuring perceived intensity. OK, let's find out if you crank up the concentration. What happens to these non-tasters and tasters that have different thresholds distributions? Well, how do you study this? We didn't have any methods for it, because all of the psychophysical methods we used were only good for making within subject comparisons. You couldn't use them to compare across people. For example, we're going to do this on a scale of 0 to 9. 9 is the strongest bitter you've ever tasted. 0 is no bitter at all. Well, how are you going to tell if two groups of people get different bitter? Because they both think the top of their scale is the strongest bitter that's possible. And what if one group is really here and another group is here? You can't make that comparison. That's exactly what turned out to happen. How did we find out? Well, everybody said salt was not affected by this genetic uh, diversity. So we took a solution of salt and a solution of PTC. We asked people to compare them. And we assumed that any variation in salt wouldn't be connected to the variation in bitter, so that a group of people, we could take their salt average, another group, and the difference in bitter between the groups would be real, because the salt standard would be effectively, on average, the same for both. We did that, and we discovered some people said the PTC was much less bitter than the salt. They're non-tasters. Some people said they were equal. Now we have a new group, medium tasters. And some people said the bitter was much more intense than the salt super tasters. The only problem was we were completely wrong about the salt. <laughs> it turns out that what makes you a super taster is the number of taste buds. And if you have a lot of taste buds, you also taste salt more intensely. But the difference isn't as extreme. So we were right. What we did still was OK. But we underestimated the size of all the differences. And years later, when we had the wit to realize that we switched to sound, and the sound standard is absolutely beautiful and allows you to do the experiment correctly, the way we should have done it in the first place. I want to come back to measurement, but I want to bring us back to the obesity question. Obesity. Do super tasters, are they more likely to yeah. become obese? What do you think? If everything tastes really strong, I, I see you shaking your head no. Why? You're absolutely so right. You get more pleasure out of the sugar. Well, that's interesting. But it, it doesn't work that way. The super tasters live in the world the rest of us have put together for them, and things are too strong for them. So you give a super taster a high fat, high sweet dessert, it's cloying. It's too sweet. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever tasted anything in your life that was too sweet? See, I didn't bring probe paper to test you. Never in my life have I tasted anything that was too sweet. <laughs> so obesity. Well, we figured if people didn't want to eat high sweet, high fat foods, they were going to be thinner. And sure enough, they were. But the effect is incredibly small. One of the things we know now is you look at a single gene and try to look at its effect on behavior, it's probably not going to be really large. It's too <laughs> complicated. But what do we know about obesity? And this starts to get me really interested. And let me mention that uh, genetic variation is one thing, but you don't realize it. But in this room, we have a tremendous amount of taste pathology. Pathology is very, very common to taste because the seventh nerve that carries taste from the entire mobile part of the tongue, the part you can stick out, that nerve passes through the middle ear 
on the way to the brain. Now, if I were building a body, I would not put an important nerve crossing through the middle ear, right behind the eardrum, because of ear infections. But it is where it is, and this means that every time you get an ear infection, and it doesn't have to be an ear infection, it can be upper respiratory infection, where you simply get pathogens that uh, inflame. Uh, and do you know about the eustachian tube, the thing that pops in an airline? It's a tube right from your mouth into your middle ear, and pathogens travel through it. So you just even have a bad cold or the flu, you can damage the cordial tympani nerve. What happens? Well. We were collecting data, and in fact, that teaching conference I went to, I handed out questionnaires. We got enough of those over the years to be able to look at body mass index. What is it? It's either height over weight squared or weight over, I always forget. Anyway, uh, look it up. It's body mass index. It's a better measure of adiposity than weight alone because it corrects for height. Turns out that if you look at body mass index and you look at a history of ear infections, they are connected. If you've had a lot of ear infections in your life, you weigh more than the people who haven't had them. And in some cases, it's a lot more. What could possibly be going on here? Well, here's what we think is going on. We haven't proved it yet, and only by the grace of NIH are we going to ever prove this for sure. We think that the pathogens attack the corded tympani nerve in the middle ear and they specifically damage the bitter fibers because they're unmyelinated and the smallest in diameter and they're very fragile. Well, in the brain, bitterness interacts with the trigeminal system. That's the part of the system that produces pain, touch, and temperature in your mouth. Well, think about when you eat high fat foods. They're oily, they're greasy, they're creamy, and that's a tactile sensation. It turns out that taste normally inhibits that tactile sensation in the brain. You damage taste, especially bitter, you disinhibit it, and now all fats taste creamier and more luscious, and your food preferences slowly alter toward high energy dense foods. And we think that's where the weight comes from. This really is so interesting, my goodness. So look, at related to this, you gave a talk um, to an organization called the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, a group I hadn't known much about, but it's, of course, devoted to eradicating the stigma uh, that attaches to obese people. And you began a talk by saying, I'm overweight and I don't plan to do a thing about it. And this got, of course, a huge response and applause from the audience. Now, you know, given what you've learned and what we know about the complex assortment of factors that are involved in eating and weight and overweight and so forth, given what we know about the health risks of obesity and the health risks of dieting, what do you think the science tells us now? What advice do you think it offers on this question of losing weight? Don't do a thing about it or do something about it. What would you think? You know, it's so dependent on the person and what your personal risk factors are. And, and um, a lot of you I've known for years, and you know I've been heavy for years. I had a very brief period of time when I lost 30 pounds, and I, this is terrible. I lost it because I was ill. I had Meniere's disease, I was chronically nauseated for three years, and still there was a little voice inside that said, wow, I'm losing weight and I'm not suffering because I don't feel like eating. And my friends would compliment me on how good I looked, and most of the time I'd just smile, but once in a while I would say, do you know how sick I had to get to get like this? <laughs> um, the fact is, uh, it's bad enough for a normal overweight like I am, but if you've ever had much to do with people who are severely overweight, and you share a bit with them the anguish that they experience at not being able to lose weight, it does change your mind about things. Uh, the sorts of, that, that weekend was a, a turning point in my life. Um, it was a very social weekend for the people who were normal members. I should tell you that a friend of mine who was a member and is a fat activist, Lynn McAfee, invited me to that. Um, she weighs about 500 pounds. Um, I invited her to come and talk to my, my uh, food behavior course at Yale. And it was extraordinary. She's a, a charismatic lecturer. And she walked into the room, and of course people go, wow, here's this woman, she's a very pretty blonde, but she weighs 500 pounds. And I had told the students before Lynn came, I said, you, you can ask whatever you want, she's a very open person, I expect you to be polite, 
but go ahead and ask what you want. I don't even want to tell you some of the subjects that came up. I had, I apologized. I was afraid I had done something horrible at Yale, but my dean said, nah, he said, uh, this is small potatoes. <laughs> anyway, the students, um, got up and talked about personal experiences of prejudice of various kinds because Lynn told them what it's like to weigh 500 pounds and walk down a street and have a complete stranger spit at you. Wow. Um, I took her to dinner that night, my favorite New Haven restaurant, and about halfway through the meal I realized everybody else was staring at us. And I got just a little dose of what it must be like to be her all of the time. Now here's a woman who's tried everything to lose weight and never been able to do it. Um, and I have a great deal of compassion for this. Now, what happens when you desperately have to for your help? I hope we're gonna be able to figure out a way to help those people, but we don't know right now how to do it. We don't know how to help anybody lose weight. It's a mess. It's very complicated, but I heard a lecture some years ago that really left me um, stunned. And the lecture pointed out that weight is a normally distributed uh, uh, attribute. And we know a lot mathematically about what makes a normal distribution. What makes it is the summation of a very large number of independent events. Those of you who know math know this is correct. Well, what does that tell you about weight? Tells you there's no obesity disease. We've got a distribution here, and obesity is a bunch of factors that are lining up at this end to make you fall here. And there's no single answer. There's no silver bullet. Um, uh, some pharmaceutical companies make a great deal of money out of trying to get us to believe there is, so we'll buy a lot of useless medications. I don't know the answer. I don't have any great answers here. But it's comforting for me to work on a problem like the ear infection connection because maybe we'll learn about one of those mechanisms that contributes to things. Maybe we can do something about that one. Maybe we can intervene. Um, we know how to turn off phantoms. Maybe we can turn off that touch phantom and make high-fat foods less palatable. I don't know but I hope we can come up with something. Mark of a scientist to say, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, it's a something not said very often, is it? Um, when we were discussing what kinds of topics to talk about, you said you'd really like to tell us the story of how you learned that the tongue map was a mistake. <laughs> so can we hear that, please? It's a yeah, great story. Yeah, I've, I've talked about this at meetings, so most of you are probably in on it. How many, how many don't know the story of the, the wrong tongue map? Oh, mm. fantastic. OK. We all learn this map, and, and um, I usually am careful not to show a copy of it from a textbook because I like a lot of the authors. So I try to show one from an old kid's science magazine, 321 Contact, beautiful. But take a look at, what is it? There's a wonderful, um, the Mayo Clinic webpage has a tongue map on it. We're all taught it, and yet there is no empirical evidence supporting it whatsoever. So how did it get there? Well, it got there because Edwin Boring wrote a book about sensation and perception where he went through the German labs and told us what they had learned. And he translated a paper from one of those labs run by a gentleman named Hennig. Hennig had studied in Leipzig with Wilhelm Wundt. And the problem was that Hennig, I don't think, knew English. So he was going to school in Wundt's lab with a lot of Americans and apparently the Americans knew some German. And anyway, what happened was Hennig's thesis got picked up and moved to the United States when the American students went home. Now, I've looked up every one of those texts I can find, and not a one of them cites Hennig. Um, I'm not really sure why. In any case, the map got put into textbooks with no supporting evidence. Well, here is the supporting evidence. Hennig did a study where he measured the threshold around the perimeter of the tongue. And it turns out that there was a tiny, significant, but tiny change as you go around the perimeter of the tongue for the threshold for the four basic tastes. Boring mistranslated the German. And he took a tiny change and expanded it into an all or none effect and drew a graph in his article uh, that supposedly showed Hennig's data. It was incorrect. He translated it wrong. Now, I was at Yale when I learned about this. Of course, Boring was a great Harvard professor, and that would have been enough for me to tell the story. But it's even better because our historians in the room can tell us Boring was not very nice to women. So the fact that he wasn't as good a German translator as his colleagues might have thought gives me a lot of pleasure. <laughs> 
Well, which brings me to a question that I wish was no longer necessary to ask you, but unfortunately still is. And that is, we still want to ask great women in science what it took to become a great woman in science. Um, the issue of gender and success is not as irrelevant as we might like it to be. Um, for, in my interests in the research on the problems that women experience in science, and particularly why women are leaving the sciences, are twofold. One is the continuing hostile atmosphere that women in science often experience from men. And the second is the problem of balancing careers with family and children. Um, in reading about your life and in talking with you about your life, you seem to have stared down that hostile atmosphere um, quite directly. But I'd love to know your experiences with both of those issues for women in science. First of all, thank you for calling me a great scientist. I, it doesn't feel like that inside my skin. I think I've been really lucky. You know, some of us get started on a nice problem. It turns out to have a really flashy uh, solution to it, and that's very nice. But the fact is... Um, Excuse me, I must interrupt you to point out that there is a gender difference in the answer to this question, ah. in which women tend to say, oh, it was just <laughs> luck, you know. I just was there at the right Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I walked right. into that, <laughs> and uh, we didn't plan this. No um, talent at all was involved, right? Linda? Yeah, you know, I, I do understand that. First of all, let me say I am married to a really remarkable man. And uh, he, when, when we first got married, he was a few years older than me and was already a tenure professor at Yale of theoretical physics. And we got married, and he said something to me that just stunned me. He said, I've got mine. Go get yours. And made it possible for me to travel when I needed to. It was, his generosity uh, was absolutely amazing. And to give you some other idea why I married the right man, let me tell you a conversation we had when we were dating. Um, my husband told me, he'd been a postdoc at Berkeley, and he told me about a situation where he had given a lecture on a theory of his to um, a group at Berkeley. And a gentleman in the audience had immediately published the theory and claimed to have been asleep in the lecture, never heard a word. And um, I said to my husband, I said, oh my God, may maybe you shouldn't publish. You know, I mean, maybe you shouldn't lecture about something until it's already in print. And he said to me, well, he said, what kind of person do you want to be? You want to be the kind of person who never shares anything, keeps everything close to your vest, gets credit for everything, or you want to be a generous person who occasionally gets taken advantage of. And I said, I was very chaste, and I said, oh, oh, yes, we want to be the nice person. We want to be the generous person who occasionally gets taken advantage of. And then he smiled and he said, the theory was wrong. <laughs> I married the right man. And we have two children. Uh, they are both grown and in the computer business. And uh, we had, uh, it was wonderful. The way we used to work it is, I would get up early in the morning, which I like to do at that point. I would go off to work and my husband would take the kids to school. And I would um, end up quit working mid-afternoon when they had to be picked up. He would work late and I would pick them up. And on holidays, we flipped a coin to see who got to work. Um, and I was really, really lucky. And I've got to tell you, I don't know how any women do it who are not lucky in the culture we live in right now. It really, uh, so pick your men carefully. Um, I'm not sure that I did it intelligently, but uh, I agree with you. I saw that. <laughs> uh, so the family thing was less troublesome for me because I married a guy who's already very senior and we could afford childcare and so forth and so on. The prejudice was harder to live with. Uh, my first job, and I've written about this, so I might as well say it, was at the Pierce Foundation in New Haven, Connecticut, which is affiliated with Yale. And it had a director who was an ex-admiral from the Deep South. And um, I, I won't say what I might say, because this is going on tape. I won't say it the way I might have. But uh, I got pregnant with my first child, and he stopped me in the hall. And he said, we're going to be sorry to lose you. And I honestly didn't know what he meant. And I said, I don't understand. And he said, well, of course you're going to quit and take care of your child. And I said, no, I'm going to work. He said, women like you are going to destroy Western civilization. <laughs> um, he proceeded to harass me thoroughly. 
uh, verbally abuse, uh, verbally abusive, and so forth. And I finally went to see my mentor in, in New York, and there's a story there, because he was not always in favor of women in science. But I went to see him, I told him what had happened, and he said, I can't help you. I don't like the man, he doesn't like me, and if I do anything to interfere, it's gonna make it worse. But he said, I think I can give you a tool he said, sit down and relax. I'm going to tell you all the gossip I know about that SOB. <laughs> it was incredibly useful. I didn't pass it on, but every time he said something mean, I thought, boy, if you only knew what I know about you. <laughs> you have been persistent, um, both, both outspoken in your words and in your behavior at confronting sexism and sexist attitudes wherever you have worked. Um, and you've had some dinosaurs that you've had to deal with in the course of your career. But I think what a sense of humor, a sense of perspective, and maybe some continuing anger, all of which would be part of the um, recipe for coping. You know, it, it's changed over time. I had a sense of humor about sexism a long time ago because I didn't have any power. And when you don't have any power, you cope the best you can. And a sense of humor is a very good way to do it. But um, I found as time went on, I didn't get more accepting, I got madder. And it got to the point where I really um, uh, would take no prisoners. Uh, and I still, try, I still try to have some perspective about people who grew up in a different era. Um, some of um, the senior men I interacted with just were from a different era. The rules were different for them, and it was hard not to, to cut them a break. I think of a terrible <laughs> a guy at Yale that was just horrendous, that talked in class about how women could never be as intelligent as men. And a young woman came to me, and she said, you know, I'm desperate to take his courses because I really want to be in this field, but I just can't stand his behavior. And I said, well, He's one of the most famous professors at Yale. He brings in a lot of money, and I don't think the university is going to touch him. So if I were you, I'd make a decision. You're either going to put up with it and get what you can out of his class, or leave it and give up a really good, and, and I feel kind of that way, that I hate to compromise, but sometimes it isn't worth it. You have to pick your battles very carefully. And I wish that I felt I had behaved as well as you picture me to myself, because I don't think I handled sexism well a lot of the time. It's interesting you say you started out um, with more of a sense of humor than you have now, but for many women it was just the opposite. They began with a burst of rage upon discovering the injustices they were experiencing in salary and hiring and promotion, and got the sense of humor later. But I think your way, it, your way is also related to the increasing success and power that you have in your field, too. Um, which I would like to ask one other thing about that. One, one thing you said that I really love is you said, you said um, one benefit of getting older is that you can do the kind of research you want to do the way you think it ought to be done and not the way you do it when you're getting tenure. But as far as I can see also, you have always done the kind of research you've wanted to do and the way you wanted to get it done. Um, although that's, that's a very important lesson because many people by the time they have tenure have given up the dreams and the, the passion for change that motivated them as younger people. But I want to ask you about the nature of research now, because one of the things that really concerns me about scientific research is that the old firewall between science and commerce is a rubble. There's nothing to that firewall anymore. And that contamination of research by industry is I think a tremendous danger for doing science the way, as you say, it ought to be done. You've had two examples you've mentioned uh, to me. One is about the study of umami and the other artificial sweeteners. And I'd love you to comment briefly about why what we know about those two things has been affected by their funders. That's um, really an ugly story. Let me start with the umami story. Uh, you probably read that umami is a fifth basic taste. Well, you might be interested to know that that comes from marketers within Ajinomoto who were very unhappy when the idea that monosodium glut glutamate, which is uh, umami, um, was not a taste enhancer. They used to market MSG as a taste enhancer. And in fact, they had a, a, a jar of it, and it said, shake to taste at table. One problem, monosodium glutamate, the way sodium salts work, 
the sodium is the source of the salty, and the bigger the anion gets, the less you can taste the salt because the anion inhibits the cation. So sodium chloride is nice and salty. Monosodium glutamate is not nearly as salty as it would have been if it had the chloride anion. It is a dangerous uh, thing to put on food if, in fact, you think what you're doing is shaking on an enhancer to bring out the natural saltiness of the food, because what you're really doing is adding sodium, but a very inefficient source. Well, I wrote a letter to that effect to the Journal of the American Medical Association, Third World War. I got hate mail from a group um, calling, the, the, the letter I remember it was a guy who said he was president of the International Technical uh, glutamate uh, Corporation, something. So JAMA sent me the letter in its original envelope so that I could respond to it, and I recognized the postmark as a little town in Massachusetts that was the home of Underwood Ham. Well, Underwood Ham owned monosodium glutamate, so there's a little volume called Gray's Register, and you can look people up. Turned out the man who represented himself as this independent source was the safety engineer for, uh, for uh, uh, Devil Sam, whatever. So I outed him in JAMA, and that really let the floodgates loose. Um, I got a lot of uh, very nasty attacks. Interestingly, some years later, one of the people who wrote one of those attacks came up to a meeting and apologized to me and said she was forced to write it by her boss. To give you some idea how much they cared about this, well, I am now on the, the no-fund list for monosodium glutamate. Um, and so it, I've, I've tried to pay attention. So what happened? So they can't call it an enhancer anymore. That was blown out of the water. So now it's a fifth basic taste, and I think the reason they picked that is because it doesn't mean anything, except to people like me who call basic tastes really important. So is umami a basic taste? No. What does Ajinomoto tell you it is? They tell you it's a protein reason. It, 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 uh, uh, umami is a, uh, the signal for protein. There's only one problem. Protein is a series of amino acids. Glutamate is only one of them. So when you have protein in your mouth, the string is intact. You don't taste any glutamate from any protein. And you all know, you know what monosodium glutamate tastes like. Does roast chicken taste like MSG? Does cheese taste like it? For the most part, proteins don't taste like uh, MSG. Well, I, I didn't know what umami did either. I mean, there clearly are glutamate receptors in the mouth until uh, one of our colleagues, Bob Margolsky, started studying taste receptors in the gut. Well, guess what? All the taste receptors we've got in our mouth go all the way through the GI tract. So they can have different functions at different places. So here's what really happens. You eat your protein. The protein goes to your stomach. The stomach breaks it into its constituent amino acids. Now you've got free glutamate. It stimulates the uh, glutamate umami receptors in your stomach, and your stomach tells the brain, this person just ate protein. Well, your brain is wired to think that's a good idea because protein's important to us. So your brain makes you like whatever flavor came with the protein, and what you develop is a condition preference for roast chicken, for roast beef, for cheese, for eggs, etc. And, and you can develop a preference for umami if it comes along with the mix. It's not a problem, and in fact, uh, you don't really like it till you develop the condition preference. So umami but, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the MSG industry. Is that um, what you want to suggest yeah, here? It's, uh, Ajinomoto in Japan mm -hmm. is the big producer. It's the big producer, and they still fund big celebrations at meetings, and they fund research. They don't fund me. I mean, I'm not t saying I wouldn't take it if they offered. But I don't think they're going to fund me. Oh, by the way, that's the trick that these industries use. Um, they never go to somebody and say, if you lie, we'll fund your lab. No, 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 none of our colleagues would do that. They get tricked into it because what the company does is looks around to see what your opinion is. And if you're on their side, and for your own reasons, then they offer you money. So they differentially fund research being done by people that are supporters. It works really well. Works well for artificial sweeteners. Just going to just briefly you. tell that story. Um, if you're interested, there is a, a debate going back to 1986 about whether artificial sweeteners help you lose weight or not. Well, in 1986, there were data that suggested that if you ate artificial sweeteners, you actually gained weight. Oh, did people fall on that? Um, the, the, the people who published the first paper were uh, beat up. Um, John Blundell published a paper in England arguing that your appetite goes up after you eat an artificial sweetener, and that's one of the ways you gain weight. He was jumped on, but it turns out they were right. And we now have an animal model for it, thanks to Swithers and Davidson at Purdue. 
And you feed rats artificial sweeteners and they gain weight. We even, they're beginning to figure out the mechanism of it. But if you will look on the web, there's something called Calorie Control Council. And it's a mouthpiece for the people who sell artificial sweeteners and fat substitutes. Further warning for us. Further it's, warning for consumers to beware. Yeah, exactly. OK. We are, now we're coming to the end here of this conversation. But because in the program we promised people that we would raise this question, I feel obliged to ask you, what was it, Linda, that we learned when we went to the Museum of Sex in New York City? I want to tell you what I learned going to the Museum of Sex with Linda in New York City was. First, that there is a Museum of Sex is an incredibly interesting thing, because New York is itself a Museum of Sex, but never mind. <laughs> Second, what I mostly learned going with Linda was, you can take the girl out of Aberdeen, South Dakota, but you cannot take Aberdeen, South Dakota out of the scientist. What did you learn? <laughs> well. First, let me give you the answer I give to people generally about why I'm interested in sex, because it's similar to taste. It has hardwired affect. And taste is the only one of the senses beside pain that has hardwired affect. And you can learn a conditioned aversion in one trial learning. There are similar phenomena on sex. That's what I tell everybody the reason is. The fact is, when we went to the Museum of Sex, I bought a glossary. You want to learn some interesting things about sex, buy a glossary in New York. And the sad part about it is, I had it in my library for a while, and it has disappeared, and it's out of print. I can't get another one. So if anybody finds a source for that glossary, I'd really appreciate hearing about it. <laughs> my advice to you all is if you can go anywhere with Linda Bartoshuk, you are going to learn something really interesting. Thank you so very much for this terrific conversation, Linda. It's just been a Thank pleasure. Thank you. This was a great pleasure. Great, thanks.